Good afternoon and welcome to Creatives in Their Spaces, um, this week's Take 10 for Soft Design Lab and I'm here with my design partner in crime, Jackie Von Tobel. Hi Jackie, how are you? Hi Deb, how's everything going over there in France? It's going great. We're all doing incredibly jealous. Oops, I'm doing a lot, lot of fun stuff and we'll talk more about that in some of our new or our upcoming webinars. Also with us today is Deborah Main of Deborah Main Designs and in this sort of reoccurring series where we talk about creatives in their spaces and how they got started. Today we're going to talk with Deborah Main. So good morning Deborah. Hello. Nice to see you both, Jackie and Deb. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. We're happy to have you here. We are. We are going to just jump right in. And so first off, first question, Deborah, how did you get started in the world of design? Well, it started in 1999. You're probably wondering why I put a picture of my patio up there. It started with remodeling my home in 1999. Um, I had a, you know, no interior design background, and um, I used to work in nonprofits, and we embarked on remodeling our home, and not having the background, I built these patios first and kind of did it backwards and then my contractor had to pour the concrete for the entire house to line up with the patios. So that was my first foray into design and I worked really closely um, with the architect and my go-to magazine was House Beautiful and so I really uh, got really into the whole design process of you know, designing different angles and creating unique feelings in each room and just had a lot of inspiration um, in creating details and shapes and texture and color throughout my home. So that's kind of how I really started. I also, um, I also got, um, yeah, there's some of the details that I was talking about just that um, in the um, kitchen, that breakfast nook uh, has that detailed cross bar that goes all the way and it connects the living room with the kitchen, yeah, right up there. And um, so it just was really um, a fantastic experience for me. I also worked with an interior designer for the first time and uh, that just kind of opened up a whole new world to me. Uh, I, she helped me come up with these colors, the green and the um, uh, the caramel and the red and and I learned a lot about uh, creating custom colors and I remember thinking when she was walking up the steps I remember thinking gee how exciting it would be to be an interior designer to create all this beauty and color and texture and you know share that expertise so it was really neat and um, it kind of planted a seed for design for me and I kind of got the design bug and you know who would have ever guessed eight years later I'd become a pillow designer but that's kind of how it started um, how did you get, wait, no, this is the same, we're going backwards. <laughs> it's that French internet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next one, I think, yeah. All right, okay. so, I mean, it's interesting to me seeing the pictures of your house. You can kind of see how you've evolved, I mean, with your use of line and stuff like that. So how would you describe sort of your signature style? Well, I want to be real clear that this house up here in the top left corner is not my home, but it is kind of at the root of everything that I love and my design style. I would kind of describe my style as classic elegance, a little bit of luxury glamour, funky edge, a little bit, you know, Austin Bohemian thrown in. But um, my background is really traditional. Um, I come from uh, growing up in New York and New England and was surrounded by antiques, classical details. Uh, this home that you see in the picture is from the main family, which is what my business is named after and is my middle name. And uh, so I grew up a lot around Victorian homes, carved wood, elegant crystal, a lot of family heirlooms that I have. And um, so it really gave me an appreciation and kind of a core to classic architecture, sumptual, you know, sumptuous textiles, rich color, history, just the whole story behind everything. And then when I moved to Texas, um, I really had a chance to kind of break away from some of that tradition and with traveling and um, starting kind of a fresh and new different style. So um, I really love unexpected color combinations and materials and um, the stories that come with everything. So, you know, um, I have a lot of that background of the tradition, but um, uh, in working with the textiles that I do, like the, on the right there is uh, the brooch. 
uh, that comes from my great aunt Adelaide that lived in that home that you saw on the prior slide. And uh, you know, that really, as I said, kind of forms the foundation of my business and I like things to have meaning in my life. And um, that, uh, that brooch has a really interesting story uh, because uh, one time when I was in Taos, New Mexico, and I was, you know, collecting textiles and ribbon at that time without even really knowing that I was going to have a business, um, I found this incredible antique store and this little French man that ran it. And I fell in love with this incredible brooch that is a hobe, and it's a large sterling silver brooch. And so long story short, I come home and I'm lying in bed one night and all of a sudden I remember the back of this brooch, the cameo brooch, has the same exact signature as the brooch that I just bought. So this huge light bulb went off in me and just, you know, this whole excitement of finding out that my great aunt collected a hobe and that's what I had all this time and never even knew it. So that kind of like jump started, you know, using jewelry and everything into my design. So, um, you know, that, um, so, you know, the textiles and everything, um, I'm sorry, I've lost track of what question we're on. Well, I, I think, no, it's, it's, no, no, you're good. Yeah, and it's great to see that, you know, bringing the history of your family into it because you can see that in your designs, you know, the inspiration and things like that. Well, thank you, because that, that is, it's really, really important to me um, and kind of really forms the whole um, foundation for everything that I do. And I really, when I started my business, I really wanted to pay homage to that side of my family uh, mm -hmm. because my mother died before I started the business, and, uh, but I made a pillow uh, for her, uh, which we'll see later on, so um, she's kind of part of it. That's so wonderful. Yeah, so the the history of the story is very, very important to me. All right. Well, I think that sometimes we, we lose tra uh, track of the idea that we should be narrators of the design, you know, design narrators as designers. So, you know, what we, we've talked a little bit about some of the things that are you're passionate about. What, what inspires you when you're pulling together your pillow line and pillow collections? You know, I really have to say almost, almost everything. I mean... From fashion to color, art, design, architecture, I love handcrafted products, I love anything that's one of a kind, I love to collect vintage textiles and jewelry, and you know, it's it's just really, um, I just get very, very inspired by everything, I mean, I could see the light, you know, and the shadows of, you know, falling on the leaves. When we were in Italy, I really, really got inspired. Um, I. Uh, you know, took a lot of pictures, detailed marble. I went to the Fortuny um, factory and had the most amazing visit and seeing all the textiles there. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of the contrast between mixed materials. So, you know, even just the, you know, the dashing in the Grand Canal in the speedboat, you know, the water and seeing that blue, the sun shine off of the water. I mean, all that kind of inspires me. It's really my environment. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a great example of, uh, you know, uh, of how something inspires me and then I turn it into a pillow. So this is a vintage uh, 1930s dress and uh, that collar up on there um, is a deep, deep, rich burgundy velvet. And I just happened to find uh, some vintage fabric that is on the back of this pillow that is in the exact color. So when I, when I see things like that, and when I um, get inspired like that, and when it comes together like that, it's just very exciting. So when I, you know, even being in my studio, you know, that just really um, inspires me working with the materials. Um, and the stories and the history. So I, I just get very, very immersed in the different layers of history and I love to repurpose and I get inspired by, you know, just doing that in itself. Mm -hmm. So. And I do see I, a lot of... I think of, here are some great... Go ahead, Deb. I was going to say, I, see, I think these are some of the photos that you took in Italy that are pretty amazing, oh, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead there, yeah. No, yeah, no, no. I mean, um, you know, the one on the left, you know, it's this huge round painting, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but, um, you know, the frame. I mean, look at the detail of the frame. I'm very, very drawn to details. And then I just was amazed at the the colors 
in the blue painting on that garment and the fold and the shadows and you know it just I mean it just jumped out to me as really rich and sumptuous textiles and the lighting you know um, and over on the right there's a door um, and just you know that one photo being on the boat this little a uh, picture of the boat down in the corner there on the waves. Stay, yeah, stay on this one. But that that door there, uh, all in that one door is the water, the, the mold, the green, the uh, the stone, the architecture, uh, the fading, the you know just everything. It's so much texture, so much color, so much history, and such a rich, rich, lush. Um, I mean, that speaks to me. Things like that speak to me in the environment. Um, same with the marble. So tell us a little bit about these slides with the, the pillows and the brooches. So fabrics and textiles and repurposing, um, I take it you love jewelry too. Oh, I really do. Um, as I said, I, you know, I had that vintage brooch and when I found out that it was a Hobe, that kind of just jump started and then I started going to Amelia's Retro Vogue, which is a wonderful vintage boutique here in Austin. And I actually uh, got to know the owner, and she, she kind of had to tell me what I was doing with my designs because, you know, it just kind of came out as an artistic expression for me. And um, she talked about, told me, like, you know, what I was doing with all the French trim and jewelry. And so I just started collecting at her store. So this picture of the three uh, blue light blue pillows was commissioned by um, uh, for a uh, – parade of homes and what was really neat about this experience was that the des interior designer wanted to uh, have her whole uh, rooms designed around the pillows so she brought me in at the very very beginning and um, she didn't pick out any accessories for her rooms until we had the pillows and so um, in the bottom picture those are vintage buttons and I just completed an order for a new online store that I'm really excited about and, uh, they ordered a dozen um, ornaments, and so we have this whole uh, family of a collection called Les Bijoux, and so the one on the right with the incredible huge, that's probably a four-inch um, uh, Dominique uh, brooch, and it's just brilliant uh, with the emerald green. And so we put a lot of brooches, and we create uh, ornaments with the vintage buttons. And uh, you know, even the brooches themselves are highly collectible. So it's they're just really, really great fun to work with. Well, I love the idea of having them on display, um, you know, in your home, and then being able to take it off and wear it <laughs> as well. <laughs> Yes. I mean, it does dual duty, so you have this beautiful object that normally would be in a drawer somewhere, nobody's seeing it, and you're giving it sort of a, a you know, a canvas to be displayed in your home so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah, it's really like breathing new life in it, and I wouldn't, can't tell you how many women I've talked to at shows, trunk shows, that say, oh, I have a whole box of great Aunt Susie's brooches in the back of my closet. I have no idea what to do with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a really great way. I mean, a lot of women are wearing brooches, and, and you know, we see them on the runway. We see, you know, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, I wear brooches. A lot of different people, you know, young people wear brooches. I mean, it just really runs the gamut. But um, this is a this slide that you have up now is kind of a great story about you know how I repurpose. I found this. Uh, you know, probably a 1960s little prom dress, or might even be a little bit older than that, in a little vintage shop up in uh, Deer Isle, Maine. <laughs> and uh, so I just was inspired by the color. It's uh, chiffon, and um, you know, not not the style of the dress particularly, but just the color and everything. So uh, I got an order from a Kentucky store uh, that I had met in Atlanta. And he called me and he said, you know, I really need a pink pillow. We're having our 10th anniversary, and do you have anything in hot pink? So I dug this out and, you know, worked with him uh, via email and phone and showed him some sample brooches and um, just went to work on it. And in the bottom right, you see that it's lying on a um, uh, kind of a flower made of a double satin uh uh, ribbon that my daughter made. She made a double layer there. And then the white is a vintage French trim that has 14 karat gold thread uh, running through it. And then you can't quite see the ruffle, but the ruffle from the dress is what, what that is lying on um, in the pink pillow. And that pink pillow was so successful that the client who uh, bought it wanted one exactly like it. So I had the challenge of 
making one exactly like it, and thank God I had all the materials to do that. So, because <laughs> you know the, the 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 pink velvet was actually vintage, and so I only had a little bit of it left. So he doesn't really know, but I had to kind of really you know finagle it. To <laughs> But that's how that yeah. that's how it comes to life, and that's sitting. Two of those are sitting in some woman's home in Kentucky, which is oh, really I love that idea. That's a great story. Um, let me ask you, what is you know one decorating lesson that you learned sort of the hard way? I mean, where did you you know have one of those aha moments where you went, ah, oh, okay, did that? <laughs> now I know how to do it the right way this time. Well, um, when I was doing my home, I started going to this fabric store called Kush Kush. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have amazing fabric stores. You know, we have a few, but not quite like that. And um, they had all this French trim and just you know beautiful, beautiful textiles. So I was doing cross stitch at the time, and um, you know, never was not doing pillows and you know was not decorating, designing, or anything. And I walked in there, was looking for some fabric, and uh, I was looking for some trim to kind of border my son's cross stitch. Of course, he had picked a dragon, right, with about you know a million colors in it. So um, she said, "Oh, try this," and I said, uh, "No, you know, what do you mean? That doesn't even match. I, I don't know what you're talking about. This no, that color isn't even in the dragon." And she said, "No, you need to use this," and I'm like. Hmm. So it just kind of, you know, almost like flipped a switch in me. Uh, it was some. I was so used to traditional and matchy matchy, and um, that whole experience just completely flipped a switch. And I went home and thought about it a lot. And I think that's when this major shift occurred. That you know, um, that I had to see things a little bit differently. Yeah, oh, that's a great story. Yeah, I went big and bold after that, <laughs> and very different. Well, sometimes we need so to step play. back from our own work and see it through other people's eyes to really, you know, uh, see the impact that it's having and maybe what it's lacking too. So, um, you know, Jackie, that's a that's a really great point. As, as I, I mentioned about that owner of Amelia's Retro Vogue, I mean, she really literally had to tell me what I was doing. Because for me, it is it started out and still is an artistic process. I mean, I understand it a little bit more, but I didn't really understand it when I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, and when That's you hear great. the description of your work from somebody else, um, they may see it as a completely different thing, which is uh, probably what she was doing, you know, than what you realize you're doing sometimes as in the in the creative process. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think it's very much like you know viewing a painting. Everyone comes away from a painting with something different. I mean, right. some people see you see one thing, some people see something else. So, you know, and I, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's just a very different experience when you um, when you're working with the art and you're creating the art, and then when someone's having it in their home. I uh, I found out about one pillow one time that this uh, woman who was pregnant and and um, you know, just wanted to buy, I guess, a piece of luxury, and so she had this whole ritual where she had this huge uh, vintage scarf pillow that I had made out as on the center of her bed, and every uh, you know, every morning she would uh, put it back on the bed. Every night she would have this ritual of taking it off, and it was just this beautiful piece of art that she had in the center of her bed that she just you know really valued, and kind of made a ritual out of it. Oh, that's awesome! So let's play a little game of sort of fill in the blanks. So we kind of touched a little bit on it, but I get inspired by. Well, like I talked about it already, but mm -hmm. I, basically mm -hmm. when I'm not, you know, when nothing's happening and I just, you know, feel like, you know, I can't really design anything, nothing's happening. I just jump in my car and I bop around town and I go to all my favorite vintage shops. And Amelia's Retro Vogue is one, uh, Flashback is another one. And, you know, even if I don't buy anything, I'm just looking through everything. I'm seeing all the jewels in the case. I'm, you know, seeing, um, you know, beautiful silk scarves or, a, you know, a 1930s wedding dress. Uh, just, you know, all these acquired treasures, you know, that they, and they come back with stories like, oh, you know, so-and-so just brought in a huge batch and I can't wait to show you the new jewels that I have. So that's very inspiring for me. So every room needs a blank. I would say something meaningful with one or two very striking pieces of art with a story. Um, in the lower left there, that's a Roy James painting, 
and there's a big, big story with that because um, my mother, um, before she died, fell in love with his paintings, and um, uh, she had actually, it was a long process, and he ended up speaking at my mother's memorial service, but that painting was one that she bought before she died, and every time someone would come visit her, um, on her deathbed, basically, she would say, "Have you seen my painting? Have you seen my painting?" And she used that painting as a as a journey, you know, to to where she was going. And so it has an you know incredible memory for me. So I I, I mean I'm sentimental. Some people you know maybe might not be, but I, I really feel like a piece of art, whether it's a a, a painting, a sculpture, uh, something that you you know found in your travels to Paris. Um, or your travels to New Mexico, I mean, anything uh, that has some sort of meaning to you, I think is really important. And so it speaks a lot about you and your home and the rooms that you live in. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone uh, to try something you do not feel qualified to do uh, because you will learn in the process. I never felt qualified to be a designer, to be an artist, or anything like that when I started. I mean, I didn't know how to sew at all. Um, it's not the best thing, you know, going into a pillow business. But so you really have to step outside. Um, and by doing that, I built this niche for myself of one of the kind luxury pillows, and so it really worked for me. And even just a couple of years ago, you know, I didn't think of myself as a blogger, but I signed up for a blogging event up in Dallas. And I thought, oh, you're really crazy. You're not a blogger, and you're going to go up there and act like you're a blogger. And it was like the best thing I could have done. And then within two months, I got invited by Modanus to go on the blog tour in New York. So stepping outside of your comfort zone, taking risks, that's, that's how you're going to grow, and that's how you're going to you know, become the creative person that you are. I, I think that's a great point. <clears throat> Deb, you there? Yeah. Yep. Oh, just making sure. I hope you all do know that Deb is in France, living the life, and she's in control here. So, um, can you talk to us a little bit uh, about your process and you know your path in starting your custom pillow line? I know that I mean we kind of touched on that actually, but um, you know what, maybe what was that? one moment where the light bulb went off and you went, oh, I have a business here. Well, there was actually a, quite a few moments, um, and I'll try to do it as briefly as I can. There were a lot of unusual, um, you know, unseen events along the path of about eight years. I didn't know how to sew. I had no design background. Um, it took me about four years to get started from the very first pillow I made. So it started with this ribbon pillow on the left by my best friend, Andrea. She made that for me, gosh, probably 30 years ago. You can see how you know worn it is. Um, and behind that is a pillow made by my great aunt, and the one on the right with the orange flower that's made by my grandmother. So I had these already. I had these kind of family heirloom pillows uh, on my window seat. <clears throat> and then while decorating my home, I was in that you know fabric store that I mentioned. And um, when I was in that fabric store, what happened was really my artistic, what I call my artistic epiphany. I was, uh, you know, looking at everything, and then all of a sudden I started pulling down all this French trim. And, you know, they just had, I can't tell you how sumptuous and gorgeous the textiles and the, uh, the French trim were. So what happened is I started pulling all this down, and an hour later there was this ribbon pillow design in front of me. And I really was not present during that hour. And it was just a phenomenal experience. And I stepped back and said, wow, what just happened? I mean, and so that was my artistic epiphany. And uh, then and then what happened after that is that, uh, you know, all the little unforeseen things started to occur. Like I bought an antique sewing machine. Didn't, didn't you know, still didn't know I was going to make pillows. Um, in fact, when I bought all those ribbons, I just tucked them in the back of my closet and they sat there for a couple of years. They were super expensive, wanted to make sure my husband didn't see them. <laughs> so, but they were really inspiring. And, uh, but then I, I bought the sewing machine, still didn't know I was going to have a business. 
uh, that fabric store ended up closing, and I bought all tons of fabric from there. My husband says, what are you doing, opening a business? Still didn't know I was going to have a pillow business. I went to China. We adopted our daughter. I collected all these silk brocades. Still didn't know I was going to you know, do a business. And then I happened to glance in a local magazine uh, and saw an open call for designers, but I just realized I missed a step. So let me go back and say that when my mother moved here, now stay back on that last slide if you can, please. Uh, when, we, um, when my mother moved here, I uh, started going to art openings with her. Can you go back one more slide, if you can, Deb? I don't know if you can. Uh, but um, I took all that ribbon and I went and had a sewing class. There you go. And the pillow on the right is what all that French trim that I bought at that, you know, lush fabric store. And about, you know, four years later, I took a pillow class, uh, sewing class. I learned how to sew, and in three hours, I came out with that pillow, and I gave that pillow to my mother. And so that was the very first pillow I made. Oh, I've got a barking dog now. Um, so after that pillow, um, you know, then. Uh, it took about four years before I started making more pillows. And how that happened is I saw an open call for designers. Uh, it was at a fashion boutique locally here called uh, The Garden Room. And I called them because I had seen pillows in their window and I said, you know, would you consider looking at pillows? So uh, I was really nervous about that, but, um, you know, because you know, I thought, well, how can I call myself a designer? I don't have a business or anything. So, but eventually I went to that open call. They gave me great reviews, and they told me to start my own website, start a line sheet. Didn't even know what a line sheet was. And then um, that's pretty much in 2004 when I launched my business, and I just kind of went from there. And uh, so all these, you know, kind of unforeseen things kind of kept leading up to it. And, uh, and I just decided to jump in. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I really didn't like working for other people. So it really kind of worked out. And then how did you get nominated for the Martha Stewart Made in America um, competition? Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, you know, I've been in business now 10 years. So um, uh, the picture on the left there is uh, the most recent um, uh, Dallas Market show and Dallas Market selected that uh, scarf pillow to put uh, in the front entranceway. So, you know, after 10 years, I, I'm in the showroom. Um, and as I mentioned before, that I went to blog tour, um, uh, I started really getting involved in social media. And I had made a specific effort, you know, the last couple of years to do that. So I guess that, you know, really. I applied for the Martha Stewart, and really there was kind of one person, Leslie Carruthers, um, who just you know kind of got behind me and started putting it out on social media. And before I know, knew it, you know, the whole thing snowballed like crazy because I had already had this following, and uh, so I got one of the slots um, that was um, selected to people who uh, had the most social media presence and the most votes. And um, so it was really an incredible honor to see, you know, all the people that love my work, that have supported my work over the years, and then new people with all the social media get behind me and help me become a finalist in the awards. So that was a really amazing, amazing experience last year. Yeah, the power of social media, you know, we, we talk about it a lot here at Soft Design Lab and, uh, you know, how important it is. It really is. It really made a difference for me. Mm-hmm. And here's Deborah in her studio and with one of your pillows, right? Yeah, and I think I think we um, selected this slide because uh, uh, you know I I really kind of started out not in the interior design world but the fashion world. Once I started my business um, in 2009, a friend of mine suggested I applied for Austin Fashion Week, and I thought. Okay, and they had a category for pillows. So, well, I mean, a category for home accessories. So I did that, and um, you know, three years later, I won the category three years in a row. And um, after that, I got just a lot of experience in doing trunk shows and you know, being out in the public. And then I decided to create a logo uh, and really focus on branding. And it really made a difference. I, I, I did these little like tests to see, you know, I'd go around to an event and I'd give someone my card and they'll go, wow, I think I know your brand, you know. And so I made it 
you know, the cards on my pillows. I made it in, you know, all my marketing materials and everything. And people just began to notice the, the logo and notice the brand. So I can't emphasize that enough of how important that is. Um, in starting your own business. And the pillow on the right and where I'm standing in front uh, in the showroom is that's our Red Brick Modern collection and during Austin Fashion Week um, we had this new section called Second Street Shopping District and that really kind of inspired uh, this new collection and so after Austin Fashion Week I think I started collect, you know, creating a lot more different collections. Mm -hmm. and modern, modern was one of them. So speaking of your collections, what's unique about them? Well, I don't really think anybody creates pillows like I do. Um, my pillows are very, uh, you know, they're, it's my personal creative expression. It's my art. Um, I only specialize in luxury one-of-a-kind and limited edition pillows. Um, I think the one that you selected to show with my collections, I have about eight different collections from, you know, traditional to modern. Uh, this is not a particular collection, but this is a pillow that I made for the uh, uh, um, BD Design uh, Pillow Art, um, sorry, I'm uh, fumbling on those words though, but it was an art contest, a pillow art contest, and it, all the proceeds were going to be donated. Uh, and so I really took the challenge on, which was a lot of fun. So the, just to explain what goes into this pillow, the, the, the front fabric is a repurposed designer sample, and it has kind of a, a crocodile pattern on it. Then the frame is made out of a uh, vintage French metallic trim that has little, um, a very art deco pattern and it has like little peepholes in there. I backed that with a copper ribbon. And then inside this frame I put a vintage chinchilla uh, piece of fur. And then on top of that is a vintage 1960s belt made out of leather and wooden beads. And then to really make it even more modern, so it does kind of have a little tribal tribal look there, which is not my intention. It's just kind of how the whole design came together. And then on the back, which you can't see, is a very bright copper and black uh, um, diamond, uh, very modern graphic print. So that kind of gives you an example of all the different layers that go into some of my pillows. And um, I have collections that you know range from the Rococo Ribbon Collection, which uses a lot of ribbon, to the Red Brick Modern Collection, which is this next slide. And all those pillows that are stacked there are made from um, vintage textiles. Uh, the top pair are made from uh, 1940s um, curtain panels. Uh, the bottom kind of uh, watercolor pair is just made from some amazing vintage fabric that I discovered at one of my vintage shops. And then the other one on the right is just a vintage cotton. So um, uh, I use vintage and new in really all my different collections, whether it's the Le Bijou family um, or whether it's the Red Brick Modern, uh, you know, uh, my limited editions and one-of-a-kind pillows use a combination of vintage and new textiles. Well, now that we know how you got there and how you put your stuff together, what's next for you? Well, um, there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Um, I can't really mention them quite yet, but there's a lot of new collaborations, new collections, uh, you know, possibly with some different materials. I'm planning on trying to attend High Point at some point <laughs> in some fashion, um, not this year, but maybe next year. Um, and, you know, we really have a loyal fan base and stores that have supported us for over 10 years so that our current customers is always our primary focus. Uh, this picture is taken at Casa Delino um, and that front pillow is uh, made from a 1960s uh, gown and that pillow is just a very, very, one of my favorite textiles and I backed it with a striped uh, uh, wool, um, almost like from a men's suit. Uh, pinstripe. Um, but my daughter is 19. She's a jewelry and fashion designer and we love to work together. So, you know, you just never know what will blossom from our collaboration. I like to keep my options open. So, there's a lot of opportunities and, and you know, I'm very much more involved with the interior design community and um, women like yourself and it's just really very exciting to me. So, I, I think there's a lot of great opportunities ahead of me. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you, because um, there are several people 
I know specifically on this call that want to hear how others started their own line because they're looking to do the same. So what are your top three tips for somebody who might want to delve into starting their own business, company, collection, limited edition line, all those kinds of things? Well, my story, you know, started as an artistic expression, so mine, mine evolved over the, the last 10 years. But what I've learned over the last 10 years is you really need to know your market and you really need to know your buyer. Uh, my buyer is wholesale, uh, that is stores, as well as um, trade, interior designers, um, as well as the public. So I do, I do both. But you've got to be, um, you've got to know your target audience. Uh, for me, I've really had to connect with interior designers and luxury brands, and that's created a lot more opportunity. And you really have to be flexible and adapt to changes. Um, the second one is make sure you have a solid vision and your brand. As I mentioned before. I, you know, made a conscious decision to, you know, have that particular logo to start using it everywhere and it really made a difference. People started recognizing it. But I also had a lot of people say, you know what you need to do? You know, all you need to do is this. I mean, you'll, give, you'll get people that will give you a zillion bits of advice and you really need to hold your ground and, um, you know, uh, really stay true to your vision. I, I think the best advice I got uh, from a very well-seasoned buyer, and this was in, in the very first store I was in, she said it takes a long time to build a brand. And uh, you really have to be in, in it for the long haul. Uh, and I'm really starting to see the benefits after 10 years. Uh, the third thing would be focus. Um, I was all over the place when I first started. I mean, I was doing eight different collections. You know, people would send me emails about advertising in this magazine and this and that. And, you know, and that was great. And I did a lot of fun events and, you know, just got incredible support and a lot of people supporting my ideas. But in the end, when it comes down to a business, you have to focus. And so um, I've really started to do that much more. And um, I've really focused specifically on getting to know people in the home furnishings industry and interior designers, and that has been a real big game changer for me. So um, focus on what you do best, you know, farm out the rest, and you know what you have to do to make your pillow line successful. And I, and I do want to add that social media makes a huge, huge difference. Great. And what are what are your designer pet peeves when you see? Uh, you know, things out in the marketplace? What sort of gets your bud, blood boiling? <laughs> well, I don't want to offend anybody, um, <laughs> but um, I don't like ordinary pillows, although, you know, they really um, come in handy mixed in with my pillows, and, and there's just so many incredible pillow designs out there. But one thing that just drives me nuts is when you see <clears throat> a couch, a, a chair, in a room, and they've picked two fabrics, and you know, part of the couch and maybe a side of the chair is in one fabric and the other part is in another, and then all the pillows on the couch are in one of those fabrics. And it's just, you know, I mean, I just feel like, you know, it's way too matchy-matchy. It's just extremely boring. Um, the design, when it's not done well like that, can look very, very trite. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm in love with a room <clears throat> where it's designed to perfection. The wallpaper, the bedding are all the same pattern. I think when that's intentional, it can look really gorgeous. But, you know, there are a lot of tons of complimenting textiles out there to choose from. So open your mind and get creative. Um, so. That's kind of my one pet peeve. I hate seeing all that kind of matchy-matchy. <clears throat> okay, so lots of different trends out there, and I know you have to say um, ahead of the game, being a pillow designer and building your collections because you're probably, with your lead times and things, you're, you're, you're thinking into the future. So what's your favorite ochre or aunt trend right now? Well, blue <laughs> is one, and it has a story because uh, I made all these amazing blue pillows probably about six years ago, and there just wasn't any blue, and the pillows were not selling, and it was at a time when I didn't follow trends, um, and I, there was a reason I didn't follow trends because, again, my pillows are my art, so if I get too involved in what the trends are, then I lose my ability to create art. So, uh, but I have learned that um, by going to trade shows and working with interior designers that the trends are important. So there's a lot of great couches out there right now. So blue pillows look fabulous on them. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, purple and burgundy and, and a lot of white. So 
I learned I learned the hard way that way in, in terms of staying on top of trends. So I love blue, and I have a lot of blue pillows now, and they are selling, <laughs> which is a lot better than it was before. And also, I really love metallic and uh, the mixture of materials, and I really love wood. Uh, the grain of wood. If I could make a wooden pillow, I would. <laughs> is, I, I love I love the grain of wood. Uh, it all comes my, from my you know collecting antiques and family heirlooms, and um, so I really like the metallics and, and wood trends too. And then our our uh, I think this is our final uh, happy question: Should we still be karate chopping our pillows? Well, maybe you two can educate me on this. I, I just have no idea where the karate chop came from. Um, <laughs> I really well, don't. Well, I can tell you where it came from. It came okay, from, tell me where it came from. It came from the, um, you know, growing away from the polyester fill pillow in, into luxury down pillows when you actually had some movement in your pillow because for so many years all we had were bricks on our sofas because <laughs> uh, companies were not utilizing down products. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. That mm -hmm. makes sense, but it still doesn't make sense to me to karate chop them. Um, but, and, good, you know, good. So, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, and and please don't chop my pillows. Um, they really don't need it. Um, and it actually, for me, takes away from the unique look and feel of them. Um, our pillows are designed specifically to have the fullness and plumpness. It's very intentional. And just like you said, because of the high quality of the feather and down. And when people use the pillows and when you're naturally using them, you know, there are little indentations. But if you just go in there and karate chop it, it's just like, it's kind of like, a, you know, kind of a fake, uh, you know, way of doing it. And the charm of our pillows come from the color and texture of the textiles and the shape and the placement of the trim. So you're certainly not going to want to chop, um, you know, one of our luxury uh, bijou or even these um, beautiful scarf pillows. It takes away from the design and it interferes with the beauty of the of the pillow itself. So you know, save your chops for mundane, ordinary pillows. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big no. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Um, so with that said, can you share um, a pillow trick with us? Yeah, I use a chopstick. Um, I use a chopstick to get my corners pointy. Um, I really, um, I really uh, like the pointy corners. I tried doing the rounded corners, you know, and where you kind of sew it, where it kind of makes the point a little bit less. But I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't happy with it at all. I like a point to have really, I mean, I like a pillow to have really crisp, pointy corners. So you basically, you know, trim the corners to, you know, to about a quarter inch of the seam. You fold it over, and when you turn the inside out, you just shove a little chopstick in there and, you know, make sure your corners are, you know, sewed really well. And, you know, maybe I backstitched them several times. And you just poke it, and out comes your beautiful corner. Oh, next time I eat at the uh, my favorite Asian restaurant, I'm kind of taking home a thing of chopsticks. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your favorite fabric? Uh, you know, or is that are there too many to mention? <laughs> well, let me see. Can you guess what my favorite fabric is? <laughs> Vintage, of course. Vintage. I love it. I love everything about it. Uh, I wish I could find more bolts of it. Uh, I love the, you know, I love mo mainly the 50s and 60s. I love this so much color, texture. This piece of fabric on the right, I think you saw that in a previous pillow. You know, that's just, an, I mean, if I had a bolt of that fabric, I would be in heaven. That fabric is wool. It has m metallic thread all through it. You can't really see it too closely, but there is um orange and aqua, it's like got these little nubby wool things and it's just an amazing, an amazing fabric and it came from a 1960s gown. Um, so I love vintage but I also love um, my new silk brocades on the left, that blue. Uh, I love midnight blue, it was my favorite crayon as a kid <laughs> and uh, that's a beautiful peacock pattern. We have that in many, many different colorways for you know designers to order and stores to order. But um, so I really like the silk brocades too. I love silk and I love vintage fabric. For color and texture. For those of uh -huh. us who don't have um, stores and the great resources that you enjoy in Austin, um, do you have any online resources that you use to find vintage fabrics? No, I do not, and I'm sorry that I can't share resources <laughs> because the thing that makes our pillows unique and different is that I don't shop where everybody shops for fabric. So I, 
you know, discover the fabric, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, like, I mean, Deb, you, you're aware of this in Paris. I mean, you, you know, you, you find something and it just really speaks to you. So I work really hard to, and I've collected for 10 years, and so a lot of my sources just come to me and say, hey, I have this great fabric for you, you know, do you want it, or this beautiful jewel. So I don't go to the, nests, you know, the regular, um, houses and the fabric uh, sources that people go to because if I did, in fact I have a story with that, I did buy a beautiful fabric in Taos one time and I came home and I made gorgeous pillows out of it and then that weekend I went into a store and I saw that exact same fabric in, in, in pillows in a store and from that moment on I realized in order to make my pillows unique, I needed to have different fabric, and so I never really bought it. I mean, occasionally you might see a fabric, you know, that I that I've bought in a store, but mostly you'll see fabrics that I've collected. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't That's share. Okay. I'm That's sorry, okay. I can't share an online <laughs> resource because I don't do it. I don't buy it online. All right. So what what would be the one thing uh, on the top of your bucket list that you uh, look forward to? To be where Deb is right now in Paris. Uh -huh. I think we all have a little bit of that in us, right? A little. Yeah, I mean, I you know I went to Italy this summer, and that was obviously incredibly inspiring, and the you know the markets in in uh, Florence, even though it was over 100 degrees. But uh, to travel more, uh, to go to the Paris flea markets with my daughter, with money in my pocket, shop for several days, and come back with one of a kind treasures. I mean, I absolutely love vintage French passementerie, and maybe I could go to Maison Objet someday. I also am really inspired now with uh, following Modenas um, and the design hounds in London. So, and I've learned, you know, through interior designers and being part of the interior design community and Modenas that, um, you know, this great design in London, which I didn't even know about when I started my business. So, yeah, Paris and London would love to go to those markets. Great. They're definitely worth it. Yeah. So I, I heard what you bought. I, it, it, I'm having I'm having the time of my life in Provence, and, <laughs> and the inspiration has been incredible. I'm sure. If you could pick one designer, living or dead, to decorate your house, who would it be? Well, um, it's tough because I don't really, you know, favor one particular designer. I love working with designers, and um, you know, I've learned so much from them. Uh, there are many that I admire and respect in the interior design community. Anyone from the AD 100 list, but um, I really thought about this and, and and went to my Pinterest board to look up gorgeous interiors and found, you know, find out well, you know, who do I really love? So I found this guy, <laughs> this designer uh, Gerard Tremolet. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, right, but he designed this French Chateau de Lille, and I'm not probably, uh, you'll have to correct me, Deb, on my French pronunciation here, but um, dream-wise, if I had, if I could have a home with French opulence in it, he would, you know, I really love everything about uh, that uh, chateau that he designed, uh, rich, lush, lush, lush colors. Also, I met Bunny Williams at um, the blog tour in New York City in 2014, and she is incredibly inspiring as a human being and as a designer. And, uh, you know, she reminds me a lot of my traditional uh, background, uh, but, you know, she also does contemporary, and she has a real classic elegance about her. Um, I'm currently remodeling my home with Patrick Landrum, and uh, he kind of knows my eccentricity and my love for you know a lot of different different designs. So um, we're going to decorate with a lot of different unique things. I can't wait to share that with everyone. Great. And oh, and I bought, oh, and I bought wait I bought a blue velvet tuxedo vintage sofa uh, for my living room, and that's kicking off the whole. Um, oh, design. back to your blue roots then. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And it's funny because really red is my color. <laughs> oh yeah. And so you mentioned that mentioned that you do find inspiration, uh, you know, online, and and so, uh, you know, just share with us something you've pinned or bookmarked and why you love it. Yeah, uh, Instagram and Pinterest, um, I really get inspired by. Um, this happens to be a room that's designed by Allison John in Beaumont, uh, Allison John Interiors in Beaumont, uh, they carry my pillow line, and I didn't pick this 
doesn't have my pillows in it. I picked it because it kind of, you know, was, uh, I mean, this, you know, if you go to my Pinterest board and go to gorgeous interiors, I mean, there's a, z a zillion of them that I love. But this one, um, and this is a little bit too old world for me, uh, my style, but what I love about what they did with this room is, you know, they, um, they used my pillow was to bring out the red in the painting. I like that. Um, they have modern lamps. I love, you know, anything that has that animal instinct with, you know, the, the rug there. Um, then they have kind of an ornate little um, uh, candelabra there. Um, and up in front, they have this, like, modern, uh, probably fuzzy poof. Uh, to sit on, and it looks like the table is kind of like an art piece in itself. So, you know, the room is filled with art, the room is filled with light, the room is filled with, you know, uh, the pillows make a statement. Uh, you know, I think they really unified this room. Um, there's a lot of color, there's a lot of texture. Um, I, I really love what they do with this. Great. But go to my Gorgeous Interiors uh, board because there's a whole lot of different styles on there that I love. And we can see what well, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. We are um, this was really enlightening, and we always love to chat with creatives and kind of get a feel for what they're all about, <laughs> and that we can share it with our design community. So thank you so much for joining us today, Deborah. Well, Thanks. I thank you very much for inviting me. It's really been been an honor, and I, I appreciate it very much. It's great to do it. <coughs> Excuse and me. And thanks to thanks to everyone who's listening too. And we we would be remiss if we didn't finish um, to finally. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in for Deborah. And then while we do that, we just like to mention that we still have some a few seats open for market. And Jackie, anything you'd like to say about that? Well, I think that, you know, as, as Deborah said, I mean, a lot of times if you haven't been to market or you haven't been uh, in a while, it's such a different, inspiring um, place of not only, you know, finding product, but of inspiration and of community and networking. And so we have really put together a fantastic uh, lineup that includes all kinds of wonderful um, exclusive showroom visits. Um, hobnobbing with design celebs, parties, dinners, um, you know, really in-depth CEU education and uh, presentations from all of the places that we're going to visit on how and why and where they make their product. So you really get the backstory um, to it. So we'd love to have you guys come with us if you're interested. We have a few spots left. It's uh, filling up quickly. And um, it's really going to be the life or, you know, the sort of design trip of a lifetime at High Point. It's five nights, six days. And um, if you are interested, just go to our Soft Design Lab website and check it out. We'd love to have you. Uh, you have absolutely. Um, no, we don't have any questions. So again, I want to thank Deborah for joining us, and you guys have a great time. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank Absolutely. you, Deborah. Jackie. Thank you, Deborah. Love your pillows. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, bye, -bye. everybody.